Okay, I think it's recording. Um, arkadaşlar merhaba, Kripto Emre'ye hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bugün de sizler için acayip özel bir misafirim var. Ee, İngiltere'den Dr. Garrick Hilleman ile birlikteyiz. Kendisi İngiltere'nin en çok e, alanında isim yapmış ekonomi profesörlerinden bir tanesi. Aynı zamanda e, blockchain'in e, araştırma departmanının başkanı ve e, Cambridge Üniversitesi'nde e, İngiltere'nin ve Britanya'nın ilk e, blok zincir e, derslerini veren e, insan. E, hey Garrick, so uh, first of all thanks for accepting my invitation. Uh, this is actually really valuable both for me and for my audience. Uh, so before we begin, I don't want to take a lot of your time. So before we begin, I just want you to also tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, what do you do and what are you currently doing at blockchain.com? Great. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you and, and your audience today. So uh, my name is Garrick Heilman. I'm the head of research at blockchain.com, a position I've held for the past almost two years. It'll be two years next month. And, uh, you know, we're about to publish a report on um, gold, looking at both gold as an investment asset, as well as the various ways you can own gold, you know, traditional financial instruments like ETFs and futures, uh, physical gold, and then tokenized gold. We're starting to see more gold tokens, uh, you know, which operate on top blockchain networks appear. And our company, uh, blockchain.com, actually launched uh, its own gold token called DGLD last year. Uh, and so I want to talk about some of the different ways you can own gold and also how gold compares to other crypto assets like Bitcoin. What are their respective, respective strengths and weaknesses? Um, but before... Before um, getting into that, just a bit more about my background, I, uh, prior to blockchain.com, was at the University of Cambridge uh, at the Judge Business School, where I, I, I started and led the, the blockchain and crypto asset research effort there, uh, starting in January 2016. Before that, I was doing my PhD at the London School of Economics under professors Neil Ferguson and Albert Richel, uh, an economist and a historian, looking at things like gold, uh, currency markets, uh, financial regulation, financial repression, and um, and sovereign debt sustainability, all issues that are very relevant to owning gold and owning crypto assets uh, like Bitcoin. And then uh, before the LSE, I worked uh, both in technology and finance back in Silicon Valley uh, for a variety of companies. Um, so that's, uh, that's a bit about my background. Awesome. So, uh, I mean, I'm also aware that you, you will be publishing a, a very detailed research on gold and like a tokenized gold really soon uh, on blockchain. Uh, but, but before we dig into that, I mean, uh, could you tell us a bit about like what's happening in the world? I mean, the, we, we're really in some crazy times lately. And uh, I mean, most of my audience, they're, they're actually expecting a lot of like price speculation. But like I said, we won't be going into that topic. Uh, because like that wouldn't be right. But still, I mean, what's happening according to your you know, view and where do you see gold and Bitcoin and everything in the near future? Right, so we, we published our investment thesis on hard assets, uh, both Bitcoin and, and, and gold, we define as a hard asset uh, last year. Uh, just just uh, uh, in June, we published a major investment thesis um, and we also came out with a blog post um, you know, arguing that now is a great time to own hard assets. You know, we feel pretty good about those calls. Uh, both Bitcoin and gold have done really well, um, you know, since last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, the investment case was, was pretty straightforward. You know, we already had before the COVID-19 crisis, you know, record setting levels of debt uh, and, and huge pressure on governments uh, you know, to, to continue to support asset prices in various ways through loose monetary policy, low interest rates. Um, these are all things that historically have been very conducive to upward pressure on hard assets like gold. You know, one of the big trade-offs with owning gold is historically is if you can earn a good interest rate uh, in a bank, um, that's pretty attractive compared to an asset that doesn't offer a yield like gold. But as interest rates have steadily kind of been pressed down to zero and negative in many markets, the trade-off, uh, you know, for owning gold has the main trade-off has really disappeared. 
Um, and that was already underway last year. Uh, and it's now even, you know, more the case and we're seeing, you know, some obviously some very crazy things in markets. The oil market, of course, has been the news this week. Uh, that's been incredible. Uh, negative oil prices. I, I was actually expecting single digits based on the evaporation of, you know, um, demand and, and uh, the evaporation of storage, but negative. Uh, that, that was not anticipated. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, like my dad and I were discussing like last week, and like he said something like, he said, he said, you know, son, you've actually witnessed a lot of stuff I did when I was a teenager, like like coup attempts, I mean, war, terror attacks, but this is the first time we are ever experiencing something in the history of humankind all together with your granddad, me, and you. I mean, three generations, first time ever. So really interesting times. Uh, but, uh, you know, speaking of oil, uh, petrol that that also raised a lot of eyes and attention lately because of the negative future prices uh, and one of our you know uh, followers actually asked a smart question and he, he wants to know if the same thing can happen with gold derivatives because I mean uh, gold also has some futures and all around the globe so do you think something like that ha would happen in a hard asset like gold yeah, so that, that's a great, great place to start. So one of the most popular ways to own gold uh, through traditional financial instruments today is through ETFs, like the GLD ETF. That's grown to tens of billions, I believe 40 billion in value uh, was the last number I heard. Uh, you know, maybe it's gone up since then. There's a huge difference, though, between that particular ETF and popular oil ETFs like USO. Um, there's no way uh, those ETFs can hold physical barrels of oil. At least they're not structured that way. They have to buy futures contracts. They have to roll those futures contracts over each month. Whereas GLD, uh, you know, according to its you know prospectus, and you know, there's people who debate you know how reliable that is. But GLD is set up to uh, you know hold physical gold in storage uh, that does not need to be rolled over. Uh, or, or repurchased in the futures market. So there is a big difference between, you know, precious metal ETFs like GLD and maybe SLV for silver and, and even a Bitcoin kind of fund, which again can hold the physical, in this case, a virtual commodity um, crypto asset uh, versus say something like USO, an oil ETF, which has to buy futures uh, and, and cannot actually take physical possession uh, in the same way some of these other alternatives can. So I, I would, you know, I don't expect, uh, you know, ETS like GLD to go negative. Um, you know, I, I just don't see that happening. I don't see the price of gold going negative. Um, that, that's what would need to happen for, for something like GLD to go negative, unless there was some kind of problem with the ETF itself uh, and how it was constructed, some kind of fraud or something of that nature. Yeah, I mean, uh, what happened with oil was just like, you know, there's also a shrinkage of demand. So this was like a one time case, but like demand for gold is never going to be, you know, that way because I mean, the entire financial human civilization is based on gold lately. I mean, since the Lydians, I mean, invented gold, I mean, everything is pretty much based on it, right? Uh, but you also mentioned silver. So this was also a question, can I ask, Really quickly, what do you think about silver's future? Because uh, back in the day, like it was possible to buy like ten grams of silver with a gram of gold, but right now, the, you know, the, they're too, too way apart from each other. I mean, silver hasn't been uh, gaining value just like gold did. So, do you think that might change in the near future? Yes, I mean, silver is not uh, a metal that I have uh, a. a you know, a strong view on, um, but I, I would call attention to, I think, a very significant difference between silver and gold and, and something we can talk more about, which is that gold is a widely owned reserve asset by central banks, multilateral institutions in the, like the IMF, governments, uh, whereas silver is not nearly as widely owned uh, as a reserve asset. That's a huge difference, and I think that is really... Um, that, that feature of gold is really core to kind of the investment thesis around gold. Who owns it? Why do they, why do central banks own it? And what possibilities does that open up about its, its future? Now, in the past, you know, there have, have been debates famously in, in my country, you know, 120 years ago, uh, where there was an effort to monetize silver. Um, and, and it's possible, you know, that if you were looking for something that could maybe figure into 
you know, some wildly new monetary regime that silver could could again receive some some push in that regard. But but the probability in my mind is much lower, just given again, central banks have this much gold and you know, little or none no silver. That's a hugely important difference between the two. And as far as I know, silver also has some industrial use. So I mean it makes sense to keep the price at, at a stable level. So I mean it can be used uh, e easily. So yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, governments and like, uh, you know, organizations like IMF are holding a lot of gold. Uh, I think I remember almost uh, a quarter, even a more than a quarter of the entire gold, uh, you know, supply is actually being held by central banks and authorities like that. So, I mean, the same thing is, is the same thing applies for Turkey as well, uh, because Turks love to, you know, hold on to gold. I mean, that's like the number one uh, investment to you know hedge yourself against uh, inflation here in turkey uh, everybody from age 7 to 70 uh, actually likes to invest in gold so my next question would be uh, why would someone in turkey prefer to you know uh, purchase a tokenized gold like a gold based token instead of just going and purchasing uh, palpable real gold yeah, well, I, I think, you know, the, the Turks uh, have been obviously, uh, you know, very smart about gold for a long time. And, and you know, we Turkey's one of the top. Right? I mean, Lydia is <laughs> basically Anatolia, so. <laughs> exactly. In the report, I've got a picture of the, the Lydian coins. And, uh, you know, so it's a, it's a privilege to be, you know, talking about gold to, to this audience. But, you know, Turkey is one of the top 20 countries in terms of gold holdings. Uh, you know, it's obvious, it sounds like for, for many Turks, why, why you should own gold, but that's actually not totally um, true across the world, and particularly also among institutional investors. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think it's actually worth starting with kind of the arguments um, for gold and just briefly touching on those before we get into the digital form, because I think, you know, the tokenized versions addresses some of the traditional um, you know, uh, hesitations around owning gold. Um, but what are the reasons to own gold? Well, you know, it, it's scarce. Um, you know, it, that's, that's certainly from a monetary perspective, a, a very attractive uh, element. Um, you know, it's pretty, you know, it's widely used in jewelry. Um, so it's, you know, it also has um, uses in dental work and, you know, computing devices, electronics, it has other industrial uses. So there's various reasons to own gold. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, though, I think from an investment perspective today, I mean, I think a huge uh, reason to own it is not only it's a scarce kind of ultimate safe haven, thousands of years of history store value, but it is the fact that it is an asset that's owned by central banks widely, and in particular owned by, um, in, in, in, and its, its ownership is growing amongst uh, countries like Turkey, India, China, a lot of rising economic powers uh, in the world are actually acquiring more Russia. And, and you know, part of the reason that's happening, countries don't always talk very openly about why they're buying gold, but part of the reason that's happening is that countries are looking to diversify their reserves away from the US dollar. And, and that's perhaps in part response to you know, the amount of money printing that's been going on uh, from the US uh, over quite some time debt to GDP levels pushing up over 100% uh, to World War II levels now. Um, you also have concerns about the US kind of um, exercising too much authority through the financial system, wanting to diversify away from the dollar for kind of financial independence reasons. And also some uncertainty about how the future monetary system is going to evolve. You know, the dollar has been dominant since World War II. Um, but the U.S.'s power and share of global trade has kind of, you know, gone down from over, you know, around 50 percent after the after the war to 20, 25 percent today. Uh, and there's a sense that the dollar is not going to be as hegemonic going forward, and and at the same time will still be an important player. And raises this question: Well, what will be the dominant reserve currency? Will there be a basket? Is there an opportunity for traditional reserve assets like gold? to maybe be a part of the conversation. And in fact, um, if you go back to the financial crisis, uh, you know, 12 years ago, um, shortly after that, you know, um, you had world leaders like Robert Zolich, head of the World Bank in 2010, 
arguing that if we were going to recreate a new monetary system, you would want to anchor to something like gold. Um, you know, it's something that central banks already own. It's popular amongst rising economic powers, and it's scarce and has you know a lot of properties you would look for in providing credibility to any new monetary system. So, so that's that's I mean, if you think about scenarios where gold can really explode in value, that's that's one of the big ones, right? That it does become a part of some kind of new monetary construct. It, it still could do really well if it doesn't, just simply as a reserve asset. We saw it do really well uh, after the last financial crisis. There was an initial plunge about 17% in October 2008, but then uh, at the end of 2008 and through the next two years, it set a new all-time high up to almost $1,900 an ounce in US dollars, um, before then falling uh, as the stock market recovered, uh, as economic growth kind of accelerated, you saw gold sell off and, and really go into a you know, six-year bear market really um, at around $1,100 an ounce. Uh, and, and so it can fall significantly uh, as, you know, interest rates start to climb, as economic growth returns. That's something also for people to be aware of. As the price goes up too, and this is something we talk a lot about when we compare Bitcoin to, to gold, you know, as the price of gold goes up, you get an increase in supply as well uh, as, you know, deposits that were previously not financially viable to mine, you know, are now profitable to mine. And so you get a, a supply response. That's one of the biggest um, relative negatives about gold, I would say, relative to something like Bitcoin, whereas price goes up, there's really no effect on the, the supply. Uh, but that's the, that's the general investment case for gold. Um, if we now turn to kind of digital gold and, and why you would want to um, own it in, in tokenized form. Uh, so we have a nice chart that I'm gonna read from here, or just kind of highlight a few things from uh, kind of summarizing the advantages of, of the token. And I think one of the biggest is, is accessibility. Um, you know, cryptocurrency markets are, are operating 24 seven from your mobile device, from the web. Uh, traditional markets, ETFs, you know, those are not operating generally 24 seven in most countries. Um, and, uh, you know, you get a big, big accessibility advantage, um, owning it in tokenized form and a big access and transferability advantage. So you can, you can transfer, uh, tokenized gold using your, your wallet, uh, you know, your, your digital wallet much more easily than you could say through, um, physical, which is constrained by the fact it's a physical item that has to be transported, uh, and divided, which is not easy. Um, another big advantage I'd say is, is val validation or, or kind of verification. Um, when, when gold is taken outside the chain of trust of custodians, uh, it has to be reassayed, you know, by a professional with sufficient technical knowledge to verify, uh, its purity, its weight, um, a digital token that represents some gold that's still held within the chain of trust, um, is something that, you know, you know, even a non-technical expert can verify is, is a, is a, is a proper digital asset, you know, by using wallet software like blockchain.com, so using open, uh, public, public, uh, blockchain explorers to check transactions and so on and so forth. So there's, um, you know, a, a much easier way to interact with gold, uh, you know, particularly if you're going to be transferring it to other parties or wanting to access it 24 seven. There's some other new emerging things you can do with tokenized gold that are quite interesting. You know, we talked about how gold, if you hold it, you know, physically, it doesn't earn a yield. Uh, you're not getting any kind of return uh, on that. Whereas with tokenized gold, we're starting to see some tokens uh, be lendable on some of these crypto lending platforms at rates of between three and 8% annually. Um, now there's certainly trade-offs and risks with, with lending out your gold, uh, to, to these lending platforms. These are new platforms and some of them have not been thoroughly battle tested in terms of their security, but it does offer a way to kind of mitigate one of the traditional uh, negatives about owning gold. Um, so those are, those are a few things. And then you get into all the general kind of uh, really exciting aspects of owning cryptocurrencies in general, that they're programmable, they can interact with smart contracts. Uh, there's a the possibility of micro ownership. So some of these gold tokens have 18 decimal places. So you could interact and own with tiny fractions of gold if that was of interest. 
Um, these gold tokens also, and this is a kind of a neat feature, many of them actually allow you to redeem uh, the digital token for physical gold. Uh, so there's an option and ability to convert it and also link your digital token to an actual bar in a vault. Many um, of these gold tokens have a capability to kind of uh, be, be linked directly to specific gold in the vault. Um, so, so those are some of the advantage that, that, that digital tokens, tokenized gold offer over traditional gold ownership methods. And I just t thought of like another advantage because as you know, as an element, gold is corrosion <laughs> resistant. It doesn't fade rust away by with time. But the gold we purchased, especially here in Turkey, isn't pure gold. I mean, it's mixed up with some copper, so it's like it stays more solid. So it's not always 24 carats. And when you hold on to that for like 20 years, when you try to, you know, uh, sell it, I mean, they actually, you know, decrease the value of the gold you have because it's not that pure anymore because there's you know corrosion in it and on top of that uh, I also need to pay all of money to my bank so I can rent a safe and put my gold there which is also like a hidden cost to you know owning gold uh, but with the tokens I don't think there is any cost of holding on to that those top tokens right well th that's not entirely true actually so there are some there are some you know trade-offs with with digital uh, tokens so so it's really important if you're thinking about buying a, a tokenized gold product to understand the, the fee structure. Because remember, these tokens are representing gold in a vault. And there is a cost, as you mentioned, with storing that gold in a vault. And the way that that cost is passed on by the issuer uh, really varies across the, the different tokens. Some will charge uh, a fee when you first buy the token from the issuer and a fee when you redeem your token for uh, either physical gold or you know, US dollars. Um, others will actually uh, charge a transaction fee. So, so you, if you transfer it you know, from one party yourself to say another, there may be a fee associated there. Um, there uh, can also be other fees. So these fees can vary across the different token projects. Almost all of them, to my knowledge, have them. And it's, it's really important. That's one of the biggest things I, I want to emphasize is that people take a close look at those fees and make sure you, you get the right token based on how you're going to be using it. If you're going to be buying and holding something, you know, is your plan just to hold it and not really transfer it and trade in and out of it, then, then something that, you know, charges lots of, say, you know, transaction fees, you know, may not be a problem for you. Uh, and you might want to steer towards that, that kind of token. Um, you know, but, but these fees can make a big difference, especially if you're buying in smaller quantities. Generally, if you buy in larger quantities, your, your percentage fee goes, goes down across these various tokens. Um, I mean, there's other, other downsides too, um, or, or trade-offs, I guess, is maybe the right way to think about it. I do think that, you know, like as we can talk about, owning gold is complementary to owning Bitcoin. I think owning tokenized gold is complementary to owning physical and even traditional financial um, uh, gold. Uh, physical, you know, look, um, you know, in theory, if you can secure it, you know, without, you know, kind of needing to purchase insurance or invest in a lot of security, you know, you don't have to pay anything, um, you know, so that can be one of the lowest costs, if not the lowest cost way to actually store, store gold. But again, you take it out of the, the chain of custody, like you talked about it, it's going to have to be reassayed. You know, there is costs, you know, there's always costs somewhere, right? Um, you know, people can enjoy their gold if they have it, you know, <laughs> in physical form as jewelry. Um, you know, uh, you know, there's certain kind of, you know, scenarios where, look, I mean, physical ownership, you know, allows you to own the gold outside of a regulated institution. Um, and, you know, in the United States, you know, in the 1930s, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president at the time, you know, did outlaw, you know, certain types of gold ownership. So it's, there's, there's precedent in some markets, Argentina, other countries that have had, you know, challenges with financial stability have regulated gold historically, and and physical ownership may offer some potential protection uh, against some surprises. Um, you know, but traditional financial markets too, you know, might might make some sense if you're, you know, someone who needs a huge amount of liquidity. Um, you know, the the tokenized digital gold market is just taking off, one to two million in daily volume right now. 
uh, whereas you've got hundreds of billions in, in daily trading volume in traditional financial markets. So um, you can get the best prices, arguably, in the, in the, in the traditional spot market. Um, so there's, there's, you know, as we talk about in the report, there's, there's definitely trade-offs for, for owning gold in different formats. Uh, and we think, though, tokenized gold is, is complementary and offers some really exciting new ways to own gold and use it uh, and actually make it potentially more into a currency than, than it's ever been uh, used before. I think that's probably one of the most exciting things is, is just tokenization allows for you know, fractionalization and speedy transfer across the world using digital uh, technology. Uh, we've never been able to really easily do that with gold. So what we can do with digital tokenized gold, well, I think we're just kind of learning, learning and figuring that out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually quite fascinating because when you think about it, I mean, the history of money, especially paper money, uh, paper money was invented to, you know, uh, solve these problems with, you know, gold ownership because it was too heavy to carry. It was too risky to, you know, move it around. That's why they decided to, you know, exchange their, you know, certificates of deposit. And that's, that's the birth of, you know, paper money. So with, and to, with today's technology, I mean, you're absolutely right. We can actually use gold and, you know, get rid of all of its setbacks due to its, you know, heavy weight or like uh, a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And for the trade-offs, I believe once this the tokenized gold market starts to grow, because I remember from the, uh, you know, uh, report that it was like 10 million USD like a year ago, and now it's around 150. So it's growing really fast. Once it yes. starts to reach into billions, then the trade-offs are going to be even less because, you know, the prices are going to be similar to the, you know, digital market. And then like they're going to come up with more efficient solutions to, you know, hold on to these purchase, transfer, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, uh, one of the other important stuff about gold is, I mean, in Forbes, they always uh, refer to gold as a war currency because uh, gold doesn't have a country. It doesn't have a nation. I mean, it's not like the U.S. dollar. I mean, it's universal. I can bring my gold anywhere. And most, most, almost anybody would accept it as a form of payment. That's why all these central banks and governments are holding on to a lot of gold. Uh, I mean, the same thing applies for Bitcoin as well. Bitcoin also doesn't have a nation. Bitcoin is also universal. So, uh, and on top of that, Bitcoin's uh, supply is actually limited. I mean, uh, with gold, we don't know how much gold we have on, on, on this planet or like what happens when there's an asteroid that hits, which, which is about, made out of pure gold. I mean, these could happen theoretically. So do you ever think that governments are going to acknowledge Bitcoin as a uh, you know, store of value? And then do you see a future where central banks start to you know, hold Bitcoin as some you know, reserve currency? I, I certainly think that's possible. And I, I wrote a blog post, uh, it's coming up on, I guess, four years ago, I guess four and a half years ago, explaining why I thought China in particular uh, had some interesting reasons to think about, um, you know, acquiring Bitcoin and promoting it as a new reserve asset. Uh, but, you know, the argument isn't just limited to China. Um, you know, look, all the gold in the world is roughly estimated to be worth close to 10 trillion dollars. You know, Bitcoin is a small fraction of that, 100 billion plus in total market value. So buying Bitcoin or acquiring it is much less expensive uh, than acquiring gold uh, today. So if you, you, you look at it from a kind of like, okay, I want to build up something that could be a future reserve asset. Bitcoin looks pretty good on that dimension. You mentioned the scarcity, the superior scarcity. Look, I, I, I think folks like Elon Musk and, and you know, the entrepreneurs that come after him are, are absolutely going to figure out a way to get out to the asteroids by Mars and, and probably find a way to bring some of that gold back if it's, if it, if it's worth doing. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that existential threat that kind of exists out there. There's a lot of gold still below ground. Um, you know, we don't even know how much gold there is. Uh, that's one of the, the tricky things with gold is, is we can only guess at the total amount that has been mined and exists. Whereas we know, you know, with, with you know, mathematical certainty, the number of Bitcoins, uh, 21 million, uh, you know, in the protocol, uh, about 100 have actually been destroyed. So it's actually been slightly less than 21 million. That's a slightly less known fact about Bitcoin. Um, but but uh, that's something that can be independently verified. And unless, you know, there's a change in the social consensus, which is highly unlikely, um, that would change the, the protocol rule, 
that would just destroy the value of Bitcoin. Um, so it just seems almost like inconceivable. It'd be very self-destructive for Bitcoin to ever, you know, approve a change to that 21 million rule. It is in theory possible, but it just seems incredibly unlikely. You know, there, there's a scarcity value that I think makes Bitcoin superior to gold. And especially when we get back to this point about the growth in the new supply, which in a couple of weeks is going to drop below 2% uh, annual inflation in, in the total new supply. Um, you know, gold's about 1% to 2% roughly in new supply as well. But again, if the price goes up in gold, then the supply can shoot up quite a bit, whereas, yeah, you know, like that's there would be incentive to dig up more gold. Exactly. Um, you know, where, where gold really falls down uh, against crypto assets is, is on transferability and, you know, the speed and ability to, to, you know, you can't pay people across the internet with gold until you use something like tokenized gold. Um, and so crypto assets are natively digital. Uh, they only live on, on, on you know, uh, digital platforms uh, and don't have this kind of physical component that costs quite a bit to store and manage. Uh, and is costly to move and verify and so on. Um, you know, there's some advantages though, look that gold has. I mean, it's got thousands of years of history. Bitcoin's been around for a little over 11 years. Uh, that thousands of years of history is worth a heck of a lot. Uh, a lot of people have tried to, you know, um, create fake gold, the alchemists. Um, there's been, you know, uh, a real time tested quality to gold that is is hard to argue with. And then also, when you think about cybersecurity, you know, and some of these, again, kind of extreme kind of risk scenarios. Now we're living through a pandemic, so maybe people are thinking more about things like solar flares or the internet going down, or, or if you're in a, in a country that might shut off the internet, um, you know, I mean, that renders, you know, cryptocurrencies effectively, you know, you know diff difficult, not impossible to use. So, so there's some resiliency value in having a physical object. And again, this gets at why we think Gold and Bitcoin are complementary. Uh, there is value in the in the track record. There is value in the in the in the physical nature. There's a huge amount of value in the fact that this is a widely owned asset by governments. That's something Bitcoin does not have today. Could it have in the future? Maybe. Uh, but you know, gold already is owned by by central banks, and it's it's increasingly owned. So that's that's a huge huge advantage that that gold has over Bitcoin. I see. I see. So, uh, so to, as a follow-up to that question, uh, where do you see Bitcoin in 10 years and where do you see gold in 10 years? I mean, do you ever think uh, Bitcoin can ever outperform gold in terms of market cap? Because I've been reading some articles, like some huge Bitcoin maximalists claiming that uh, the millennials and the latest generations are going to you know, accumulate Bitcoin just as their grandfathers you know, their parents accumulated gold. So that, you know, mentality of investments is going to change and that's going to, you know, affect the Bitcoin's market cap, you know, tremendously. I mean, I'd also love to hear your thoughts about, you know, both assets in the near future. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, from my, my perspective in 10 years from now, we'll still be talking about gold, we'll still be talking about Bitcoin and, and I think they'll both be worth quite a bit more than what, they, what they're worth today. Um, you know, there may be some bumps in the road, some volatility, but, you know, the environment we're in today uh, with unprecedented debt levels, you know, monetary stimulus likes of which we've never seen, you know, this kind of like very rare phenomenon where, you know, we might be going through a monetary regime change and all the uncertainty that's going to create and the desire to maybe look beyond just adopting another country's um, currency as a reserve asset. I think all these things are setting up, you know, for, for gold and Bitcoin to do very well. What's also really exciting in Bitcoin's case is I think we're just, you know, beginning to tap kind of the broader potential of its blockchain technology. Um, you know, we have, you know, still very early stage efforts like what Microsoft's doing uh, to kind of build a di digital identity platform that is anchoring to the Bitcoin blockchain, leveraging its security, you know, efforts to utilize, um, you know, you know, Bitcoin is kind of a database for time stamping and other things that have nothing to do with money. Uh, and this whole kind of flourishing blockchain and crypto asset ecosystem, which Bitcoin really serves as kind of a safe haven within and is kind of the key anchor currency, uh, 
you know, I, I think, you know, that, that all sets Bitcoin up for a really incredibly bright future. Um, but it doesn't have the thousands of year track record, you know, that gold does, you know, there's always the possibility that there's some kind of bug or, you know, issue that is difficult to resolve. Um, you know, these are all reasons why we think Bitcoin is complementary with gold rather than a complete replacement. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think in 10 years uh, time, we'll, we'll still be talking about both. And uh, there's a very bright future. You know, can Bitcoin, you know, become more valuable than gold? You know, that's a great, great question. I mean, you know, at nine, 10 trillion, that's a pretty, pretty big number to try to try to reach. I, I think it's certainly conceivable that Bitcoin becomes a trillion dollar asset. I mean, it was on its way there in 2017. That was obviously very uh, bubbly. But, but when you look at, you know, its role as a hard asset and its superiority on a number of dimensions layered on top of its other use cases for security and, you know, and so on. I mean, you know, it could grow beyond the current market value of gold. That's, that's a not unrealistic scenario. And that's partly why it's such a, an exciting asset to hold is it has this really asymmetric, you know, kind of range of possibilities. Uh, if you're an investor thinking about buying gold or Bitcoin, you know, yes, it could go to zero, no question about it. Um, but, you know, it's one of the only assets that could go up, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 X or more from here as well. Um, and that's a nice asymmetric, you know, bet that I think more and more people are starting to think, you know, it's, it's, it's good for me to have some of this in my portfolio. Now, it's also important to be aware of the volatility. That's one of the reasons gold is also attractive, right? If, if you need something that's less volatile, because uh, you don't want to be missing out on this bright, bright future, you know, the gold, you know, can provide that, um, you know, that, that kind of hard asset kind of dimension with reduced volatility and more established kind of financial markets and pricing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, as a final uh, teaser, I mean, like a brain teaser question, uh, just imagine that I will be giving you a million dollars uh, and you can only invest it in either gold or Bitcoin. Uh, which one would you pick? Oh, Bitcoin. No question about it. I mean, now, again, you know, you need to have something to pay the bills. And, <laughs> you know, it, you know, if that's all the money you've got, then, then, then, you know, you need to be a little more cautious. But assuming you have, you know, your basic monthly not covered, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, and you can stomach the volatility, it's not going to cause you too much, you know, lost sleep. Uh, I, I think the upside and, and the qualities, you know, and, and partly it's also, you know, like, where's the world going? Things are becoming more digital. You know, when you look at the surveys of young people and kind of what assets they're interested in, and young people in particular, uh, in many countries are, are very, very keen on, on cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, I, again, I don't think gold's going away, but but it is a more traditional, you know, asset to, that appeals to kind of I think older generations than than digital. People want, you know, you know, I, I've spent like an hour on the phone with my bank the last day, you know, trying to you know move money. You know, this this this whole experience is just a nightmare, you know, and and it just makes me just you know just beg for, you know, good technology, digital solutions, things that can happen quickly. You know, Bitcoin offers that, whereas gold's kind of, you know, yesteryear's, um, you know, safe haven, but, but very difficult, cumbersome, time consuming. I, I just, I, I think the future is much, much brighter and there's a lot more upside for, for an asset like Bitcoin personally. Awesome. Well, Gary, I mean, this has been so much fun. Uh, I would love to go on and on and on. But as I said, I mean, people don't like super long interviews. And also you got to think about me because I'm just going to go and like spend hours and adding Turkish captions to these, but thanks for, you know, uh, sparing the time for me today. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the research that you will be publishing uh, on blockchain. And I'm hoping to do this in the future and see if we were right or wrong about like what we just said today. Thanks everybody. It was a pleasure uh, anytime and uh, you know, uh, look, look forward to the next time as well. All right. Awesome. So you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.